All right. Well, good day, everybody. Hope you guys are doing well. Obviously, the weather did hit pretty hard and we're not having school on Friday. So sending out this video, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, further about industrialization, uh, about factories, about uh, the development of steel and oil a little bit, then some power sources, so on and so forth, and then even some of the positive negative impacts of the industrial system. But we're going to go ahead and do this day in history. So this day in history, February 4th, 2004, uh, Facebook was founded uh, and began its platform. Uh, interestingly, Matt, I don't remember exactly when I first encountered Facebook, but it kind of was founded primarily as like a, a social networking for college students, but obviously it became much bigger over time. Also, this day in history, 1861, the Confederate States of the United States was born as uh, the first uh, nine southern states that had seceded met together in Richmond, Virginia to create the Confederacy. Um, they didn't choose their leaders that day, but they started that, that process to break away from the United States. This day in history, 1789, George Washington was unanimously chosen by the Electoral College to be the first president of the United States. And this day in history, 1938, the first full feature animated film, and it was made by Walt Disney, was released in theaters, and that film was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, so that was the first feature length uh, animated film. Uh, being I want to be fair, not one of my favorites. I just find Snow White's voice to be way annoying, not even slightly, but a lot annoying in, in that particular uh, movie. But a lot of the other old Disney movies are really good. All right, famous birthdays today. We've got several incredibly famous ones. Um, Rosa Parks, obviously uh, her uh, unwillingness to give up her seat set off a, a chain of events which led to um, a lot of civil rights actions and civil rights marches. Uh, she did this in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and what a great moment, obviously, a uh, great moment for her and, and just as far as breaking down racism in the United States uh, in that process. Uh, Charles Lindbergh was born on this day in history, the first man to successfully do a solo flight across the Atlantic. Uh, it made him world famous. He wasn't just like a famous American, but he became uh, famous across the world. Uh, we'll talk more about him next year. Well, in two years, sorry, in American history. Also Rosa Parks as well. Byron Nelson, a famous PGA golfer uh, back in the 40s and into the 50s. Uh, he, in his career, he won five major tournaments, and in 1945 alone, he won 19 tournaments, uh, so one of the greatest seasons ever, and there is actually a tournament still this year called the Byron Nelson Classic that is played every year in the PGA. Lawrence Taylor, famous NFL football player, played outside linebacker for the New York Giants. Some people would argue he's the greatest defensive player of all time, which could be possible. I mean, he wreaked havoc uh, on a team's offense. In fact, if you've seen the movie The Blind Side at the beginning, they're watching a clip of a game. And um, it shows uh, a quarterback getting his leg broken. It was Lawrence Taylor who broke that quarterback's leg. He wasn't intending to because you could tell by his reaction he was really upset that it happened. But uh, he was just really hard to block. Uh, Clint Black, famous country uh, music star. I don't know a lot about his music because I don't listen to a lot of country, but I've heard his name and, and know he's real famous. And then last and least, you heard me say it correctly, least, Hunter Biden, a uh, famous business executive, according to the website I looked at. Or maybe he's a business executive simply because his father uh, has been a famous politician in the United States. All I'm trying to say is Hunter Biden probably would have never done any business of any kind if he wasn't connected to an already powerful family. And obviously his dad is now the current uh president of the United States. Fun fact, fried brain sandwiches used to be a popular dish in the St. Louis area in the late 19th century, and it's still a local delicacy in the Ohio River Valley area. However, now instead of cow brains, it is typically pig brains on your fried brain sandwich. Now, um, that being said, uh, I know that my dad, I never ate this, uh, you wouldn't catch me eating this ever probably in the history of the world, but my dad um, talked about when he was younger growing up on a farm that they ate pig brains, hog brains and eggs. Um, so like scrambled eggs with hog brains. 
just sorry no thanks uh i'll just i'll stick to other things with my eggs all right so let's get going on the factory system here um and how it kind of changed the lives of the people involved and this is actually the first question on your assignment do stay tuned all the way through this video because i will throw in a couple other random questions that aren't on your your uh, guide so uh please stay tuned don't uh don't just like quit watching when you've heard the answer to the last question all right and so in the earliest stages of the industrial revolution there were no factories in a modern sense workers lived in rural areas uh they labored at home okay, this is what life was like before industrialization they worked with their own tools so they owned their own tools for the most part they were able to set their own work schedules um, because they lived at home and worked on their farms at home and they could determine how much they wanted to produce so if you wanted to work extra hard uh, or uh, maybe you even hired a, a hand if you were doing a, a little bit better and you could afford to do it to work with you so you could produce as much as you want or as little as you wanted to work as hard as you want work as little as you want um, the factory system however changed that system the workers raw material materials and machinery were now under one roof this would be including those tools uh, and oftentimes these factories would be located near transportation routes sources of water power initially and natural sources now eventually we'll talk about how with the changes in transportation and, and power sources they were able to move these away from the the water but initially you found most of these factories along water so they could use that as a power source Obviously, this system replaced the domestic system of farming in four significant ways. And here's how life changed for the workers. The worker often moved to an urban environment to be near the factory. So obviously, typically near cities, it could be towns as well, it didn't have to always be a large city, but you typically weren't gonna be living on a farm any longer. Also, the person typically no longer owned the tools that they were using to work with. Instead, the factory owner uh, owned those tools and the workers would just use those tools to make the products or whatever things they were making in that factory. Also, the worker never no longer controlled the number of hours they would work per day or the pace at which they work. So now you typically had to work really hard and we're gonna talk about it later, but you had to work a lot of hours. It typically was not a short work day. Now, to be fair, if you wanted to have a fairly successful farm and wanted to survive, you probably did work a lot of hours, but you know, if there was a time of year where you didn't, didn't want to work as hard, or maybe there was a, a day or two, you know, where something happened, and you didn't want to work hard, that could work out. But in this factory system, that typically doesn't work out. You got to work really long hours, really hard every day. Also, um, the job now was away from the family. Like in the past, you worked on the farm. So we're talking primarily about men. All the women are going to work in the factory system as well. Uh, but primarily about men, you think about it, a man was working in the field. Uh, the husband was out there, the father out working in the field, the wife oftentimes, and the mother was oftentimes also working out in the field. Maybe she was working closer to the actual house. Uh, she also was probably doing some housework as well. Um, but they were really close. He, the, the dad could just come home for lunch. Uh, he would be home for dinner, uh, and he could come eat dinner when he chose, you know, it wasn't based upon, you know, when he got off a job that he had no control over his schedule. Now, the man work, works away from the family uh, and is no longer at home as much. So you begin to see uh, a, like a work uh, zone where the man typically is no longer near the family. And like I said, women will eventually join the workforce in smaller numbers, but uh, eventually to now where we are today, where they join it in much larger numbers. But now a lot of people obviously just work away from the home, but that was very unusual for the time. It doesn't sound unusual to us because we live in a system where this has been around for a long time. That's quite a change. Uh, and cause some changes not only in uh, the job, but in society in general. Okay, there we go. Um, so industrialization, we already mentioned this a couple of days ago when we last talked, um, developed first in Great Britain. You had your industrialization developed there first. Uh, as far as on the mainland of Europe, Germany was a little behind it, but Germany began to quickly industrialize as well. Uh, and began catching up to Great Britain as far as their industrial capacity. Um, across the world, places, other places that uh, grew pretty quickly as far as industry, United States uh, quickly once again caught up with Great Britain and Germany as well. 
Uh, United States is larger too, as far as land area, a lot of resources. Japan, now Japan comes a teeny bit later simply because Japan uh, is living a more feudalistic society with you know their, their samurai and the shoguns and all that type of thing. But the United States and Great Britain take a great interest in Japan and help them modernize quickly. Uh, and they quickly become a very powerful industrial nation. Uh, and parts of Canada, not all of the parts of Canada also develop industrially. Now, parts of the world that don't develop quite as quickly, uh, there's not as much industrialization in Russia during this time period. Southern Eastern Europe, uh, you know, places like uh, Poland, uh, what would be the modern day Czech Republic, Ukraine, uh, Serbia, now we're getting into Southern Europe, uh, even uh, Greece, those places do not develop nearly as quickly. Uh, even Italy, who becomes pretty powerful, is a little behind the curve as far as industrialization um, is concerned. Now, not to mention places like South America, Africa, and most of Asia, except for like Japan, like I said, they, they're way behind the curve. Uh, in fact, you know, we would talk about today places like India and uh, China are in the phase of industrializing right now. They're becoming very powerful as a result, but they are much later to industrialization. And then other parts of the world, even today, uh, Af Africa especially, and some parts of South America still are lagging far behind in this process. Uh, two important things that happen is iron and steel production, the development of those and making it more available, especially steel. But let's talk first about iron. One of the reasons Great Britain actually does so well early on is there's a great a deal of iron ore in Great Britain. Um, the, but before the Industrial Revolution, charcoal, which is a wood byproduct, was being used to smelt ore, uh, but it was becoming increasingly scarce. Uh, so iron markers, iron workers, sorry, began using coke, which is a coal byproduct in the smelting process. So not Coca-Cola, no, they weren't using soda, <laughs> but uh, a part of the coal byproducts. And Britain had large coal deposits and iron deposits. The products of this brought about a great deal of change and helped them develop quickly uh, in this area of iron. Um, coke became cheaper because there were large coal deposits as well. So it made it easier to make iron at a cheaper price. But it also helped that in 1784, Henry Court invented a process by which iron ore was puddled uh, or stirred in a furnace to get rid of impurities, which produced, produced a versatile product called wrought iron. So a better product, a purer product, and cheaper because Coke was so available to the British. Now, other parts of the world eventually as they catch up, they're also gonna have large coal deposits that helps as well. However, it wasn't until about 1856 that it was expensive and, efi and efficient uh, to make steel. Now steel, has been around for a long time. There were steel swords way back in the day, um, but you would only make steel uh, in small numbers. It was pretty rare, it was very difficult to make, very time consuming, very expensive. So once again, the development here is going to be that someone is going to find a way to mass produce it and make it in a cheaper way so it can be used in a lot more structures. The man responsible for developing this was Sir Henry Bessemer, uh, who found that by shooting a jet of air into molten iron, it would help it to rid it of more, imp more impurities than by adding carbon and other metals, uh, he developed steel. Um, steel production increased dramatically as a result of this innovation. Britain, Germany, and France, and Belgium produced 125,000 tons of steel in 1816, 125,000 tons. By 1913, so 53 years later, it produced more than 32 million tons. Okay, so you're talking about a huge amount of change. In fact, early industrial revolution is sometimes called the age of iron. The later stages of the industrial revolution is called the age of steel. In the United States, this is a question you'll need to answer. The man that became America's greatest steel producer and eventually the world's greatest steel producer was Andrew Carnegie. Um, and uh, he had basically created a monopoly on steel, especially in America, but even across the world, people were buying the steel. Now, one of the things that's important to under about, understand about steel is, you know, I, I briefly talked about swords a minute ago, 
being used, but you're probably wondering what it is still so important for. Um, besides some things that might be obvious to you, obviously uh, a written, original um, railroad lines would be made in iron, but they eventually replaced those with steel. Um, but steel really the big thing is it allows you to build bridges across larger bodies of water and it allows you to build taller buildings. So without steel, you wouldn't have skyscrapers, you wouldn't have tall buildings, uh, cities would have never had the tall buildings like we have today. Uh, that allows you to have house a larger, larger population in a smaller area because you can just add more floors. Um, also, like I said, if you didn't have steel, we wouldn't have bridges across like the Mississippi River or big large bodies of water because uh, iron isn't strong enough. So steel made all those things possible. Um, and it's obviously still used today in a lot of bigger construction things as well. So it's still a valuable product, but definitely helped develop and change uh, the way things are built. Uh, obviously another big development in the process of uh, the industrial revolution is new sources of power. So water was always a source of power that was used to run machinery, but discovery of new sources helped the factory system move away sometimes from um, the water sources uh, so they could be closer to the market or closer to transportation. Uh, the first of those was in 1769, a Scotsman named James Watt, Watt, sorry, W-A-T-T, -T, uh, designed the first practical and efficient steam engine. Now, I didn't say the first one. There were steam engines before him, but his worked really well, and it was uh, a more practical and more efficient and more reliable steam engine. Steam power made it possible for factories to be strategically located near markets and near uh, transportation instead of near water. By the late 19th century, new energy sources began to replace steam engines. Uh, the invention of the electric dynamo, it's a machine that turns mechanical energy into electrical energy. Uh, many factories were be able to convert to electrical power. Um, by 1914, half of all the power used in British and German industries was supplied by electricity. Uh, the United States would follow a similar trajectory. Uh, electricity, for electricity, it does kind of center and start in America. You kind of have a battle between two different individuals over two different types of electricity, direct current by Thomas Edison and alternating current uh, by Nikola Tesla. A couple of years from now, also in US history, we'll discuss this in more detail. But Tesla's AC eventually becomes uh, kind of the hallmark and the standard by which uh, electrical power is um, produced, um, and it is still today, to this day, electrical current uh, by uh, alternating current uh, is what is used worldwide. Um, now, they might do it a little bit differently in Europe, but it still is that alternating current method that can produce larger amounts of electricity. Lastly, another uh, source that was used for power was oil. Um, the first commercial oil well was found in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859. Although oil initially was primarily used for um, uh, things like uh, kerosene to light your house, that's what it was originally founded uh, for. Uh, it eventually developed and became very powerful because of the internal combustion engine um, in 1885. Interestingly, the man who, uh, led not just the United States, but worldwide as far as dominated the oil industry. It was John D. Rockefeller. Uh, he owned over 90% of America's oil at one point in time. Uh, and worldwide, he owned over half the oil production, um, refining oil, especially and taking it to the market, uh, producing a, a company he called Standard Oil to try to create the standard for what a good product looks like. Uh, and luckily, uh, for someone like John D. Rockefeller, you know, he's developing kerosene and electricity comes along and you're like, oh man, he's going to lose all of his business. Well, the byproduct, literally the byproduct of kerosene is gasoline from the oil producing process. Uh, so he was able to once again also corner the market on gasoline as well. Well, obviously there's a lot of changes in transportation during this time period as well. One of those is simply, it seems pretty simple, but better roads. Uh, are a big deal. The British began this process by greatly improving the system. Uh, they called something a turnpike trust, which uh, these roads were financed. Uh, and then they charged a toll to those traveling on it to help pay for those roads and to maintain those roads. Uh, in 1788, Britain had 18,000 miles of roads. 
so I, I think I might have said the wrong year, 1788. Um, they also devised a new type of road with tightly packed crushed rocks. Uh, travel by stagecoach became much faster and much easier. The construction of canals, this is literally where you just dig out the ground uh, and you then uh, put water in so that you can shorten routes and this lowers the cost of transportation. This is especially used mostly to transport heavy and bulky industrial goods. I mean, you don't see a lot of like pleasure cruises along canals. They're not typically like known for like, you know, great scenery or anything, but it would make a quick route from point A to point B to get your industrial products, your industrial goods from one point to another. Uh, England dug its first canal in 1757. By 1850, 5,000 miles of canals crisscrossed the nation. In the United States, uh, one of the early canals came a little bit later than 1850, but it was the Erie Canal, which connected New York City to Lake Erie. Uh, and just along the way, a lot of shipping was able to be done. Obviously, a huge change was railroads. Initially, they used steam engines to run the railroads, and you had railroad tracks crisscrossing countries. Uh, like everything else we've said, the railroad starts out by just you know a small amount of tracks from one point to another, but eventually you have railroads crossing entire countries. Uh, and for the most part, railroad is still about industrial goods being shipped. But now with railroads, you do have a lot of passengers too who will ride on these rail lines to crisscross the country. Um, this can also help when you're talking about moving uh, from one side of the country to the other. Um, so in the past, before railroads, let's say you, and let's use America as an example, you wanted to move across country. Well, you would get on a wagon uh, and to put your goods in and you and your family would take that wagon. Uh, and I'm not making this number up. It would take, if let's say you were wanting to go from somewhere along the East Coast, uh, move out to California, which I know is really far on the other side of the, the map, but you'd take four to six months to do that, depending on weather, depending on time of year, depending on, you know, how many, if you broke some wheels on the way, how, how long it took, four to six months. You heard that number right. A wagon would travel on average 10 to 20 miles a day. Okay. Um, that's not very far, guys. That's really small amount, but uh, it was very hard to travel. You had to find a way. Sometimes there were a lot of trees in the way you had to go around. I mean, it was just an arduous, slow process. Uh, now you take a railroad across country. It's not going to happen in hours, but days. You know, if you're, let's say you're, you're wanting to go from, um, I don't know, Massachusetts or New York to, to San Francisco, three, four days, not four to six months. What a difference that is. Okay, steam power was also used to uh, propel ships. Uh, they would build, start building the ships out of iron and eventually steel as well. The steel comes quite a bit later, uh, but steam power, once again, same thing, much quicker. So a journey that took uh, months, you know, let's say you wanted to go across the sea with a, a ship that was propelled by sh uh, sails, that would take you uh, one and a half to two months if you caught good winds, maybe one month in some lucky way, it would take longer than that normally, but one and a half to two months, uh, that wouldn't be changed to like 10 days to get across the ocean because of steamships. Now, a lot of these early steamships weren't reliable sometimes. Uh, and even if they were reliable, people didn't think they were reliable. So they still put sails oftentimes on a lot of these early ships uh, just in case things didn't go well. Now, eventually steam ships and steam railroads were replaced by diesel, but that comes uh, in the 20th century in the early 1900s. Okay, uh, you also had the development of air travel, although this comes obviously in the 20th century. The first successful air flight was in 1903, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, Orville and Wilbur Wright, first successful uh, controlled uh, flight. Now, it was not a long distance and it took a while for you to actually make this viable um, but they but they figured out a process of how to do that, and from there it was built. Think about this real quick. This this flight here, you know, was for uh, you know a little over ten seconds. Didn't go that far. By 1969, so 1903 to 1969, 66 years later, there was a man on the moon. 
We went from barely being able to fly to going to the moon. Okay, what uh, an enormous amount of technological advancement happens beginning in the late 1800s through the 20th century and into the 21st century, which we live in today. You also have the development of automobiles, which comes about. Now they come about, uh, the internal combustion engine we just talked about in 1885. After that, you do get cars. Interestingly, there were some steam powered cars. Uh, they tended to overheat and weren't the greatest, but we're talking mostly about gasoline propelled cars. Uh, and uh, Henry Ford is oftentimes associated with this, but Henry Ford did not invent the car. Okay, the first car was not created by Henry Ford. Um, we'll talk about him in a second, why it was important. But you do get cars in the 1880s, 1890s, into the early 1900s. But at, during this time period, the car is very expensive. Only a few people can afford it. Uh, it's still not as reliable as it could be. Uh, Henry Ford does begin producing the Model T Ford in 1908. Uh, but really what Henry Ford's innovation is, is using the assembly line, which is on the next uh, uh, slide. So I will talk about assembly line more in detail in a little bit, but he is the, the first to use the assembly line to make cars. You might be like, how much did this change the process? Well, before the assembly line, Henry Ford could make, the Ford Motor Company owned by Henry Ford could make a Model T in 12 hours, one car in 12 hours. With the assembly line, they take that 12 hours and you can make a car in an hour and 33 minutes. So in that same time that you were making one car, you now could make nine to 10 cars type of deal, you know, type of uh, idea. Um, I might not have done my math right, maybe it's eight cars but much faster to make cars. What that means though, is then that the car prices go down so that average everyday people, maybe not the really poor, but somewhat poor to medium wealth people can now afford to own a car. So it revolutionizes the, the ability for people to, to uh, go from point A to point B because more people can own cars. So a big part of this is the idea of mass production. Uh, and, um, this kind of is the new production techniques used in a lot of these manufacturing plants. Uh, a lot of this happens between 1817 and 1914, as you begin to see the production in Europe and North America triple uh, due to these new methods. One is automation. In its early stages of industrialization, new machines help workers perform their functions more quickly and efficiently. As the years progressed, other machines were invented to run the first machines. So more and more automation over the years. Now people would still have jobs, but now their job might be to work on those machines to make sure they function properly in case they break down or in case they start having problems instead of directly making the products. Now people were working on the machines that were making the products. Interchangeable parts, uh, due to the expanding role of machines, it was important to have interchangeable parts. Uh, in the past, uh, if a part broke down, you had to handcraft a part to replace a broken part, or sometimes handcraft the whole item again to replace it. Um, so repairs were long, slow, and they cost a lot of money. With interchangeable parts, products could be repaired easily and cheaply and quickly with identical pieces that were made. So, you know, interchangeable parts, you think about uh, multiple things I can think about, like Lowe's and Home Depot. You can go get um, parts that are standard that you can use to fix uh, all kinds of different things in your house. And you think about like a car parts store. You know, let's say something breaks on your car in the past, way in the past. I realize interchangeable parts has been around a long time. But let's say you own one of the first cars. You need to fix it. You'd have to have literally go to somewhere. They'd have to get the machinery out to make a part for you to replace that part. Now you can go down to your O'Reilly store or AutoZone or whatever auto parts store you're going to. And you can say, I need a, um, I'm trying to think of a, a part right offhand. Uh, I need an alternator um, for a, you know, 1997 Ford Mustang. And they can look in their data book, find that part. Occasionally they don't have it in store. Uh, if not, they can maybe get it in store quick, sometimes it, within that day because maybe I don't know, O'Reilly somewhere else in Oklahoma has it. Or they might say we can order that and have it for you in two days. Wow, so much quicker, so much easier. Also, you know, sometimes you might just take someone else to fix your car because you can't fix it, but they can get the parts 
because they're interchangeable now. All right, division of labor. In the past, skilled craftsmen will work on their products from start to finish. Uh, we talked about this a couple of days ago with the textile industry, but a tailor would literally cut the cloth, make the cloth into something usable, then make the, then, uh, you know, sew the cloth together to make a piece of clothing uh, and have to do that whole process themselves. But uh, because of the division of labor, uh, you take this procedure that one person was doing and a number of workers divide the manufacturing process into several simple procedures. Uh, and it to, uh, speeds up the process, makes people to, able to make these things quicker, easier. Uh, and each person becomes like an expert at one part of the job. Now, there is a downside to division of labor. If your job is, uh, the best example I like to say is from a movie that some of you may have seen, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That is the newer one with Johnny Depp. Um, although I think it, it does do mention this in the older one either, both. I think it's in both of them, actually, that Charlie's dad in those movies, what he does for a job is to screw the lids on, <laughs> on a toothpaste thing. That was his job. Okay, so division of labor makes things faster, but it also can make your job very monotonous, very boring. Um, you may be an expert on what you're doing, but it could be very tedious uh, and, and can almost just be so boring you don't want to have that job. Um, but it does speed up the process. Assembly line, this is simply where you accelerate the production, kind of like division of labor, but this would be where you station people along a conveyor belt to assemble different parts. And we talked about it with the Model T being a great example, but other industries use this as well, the assembly line division of labor to create products. Now, what is the positives of this mass production? Like I said, it can be a negative as the job can be really boring, but the positive is things get made faster, easier, which means the cost of everything goes down. So your clothing costs less, your cars cost less. Uh, literally everything can be mass produced now pretty much. And that means the cost of goods goes down, which means average everyday people can afford to buy things that at one point in time would have been seen as luxury items now are common for all people. Now, what are the consequences uh, for this um, type of system? Um, obviously, there are a lot of advances uh, in uh, invention. Uh, we talked about Thomas Edison briefly, uh, chemistry, a lot of advances in those fields. Uh, oftentimes, to uh, fund a lot of these things, business finance gets involved. So banking, although it was important before, this becomes incredibly important to help build these factories uh, and for it does create uh, less. And well, we still got a lot of small businesses, but you do see the rise of corporations of these businesses that are very large. Uh, in America, JP Morgan financed many of these so much. And he was so involved that in some of these, he also controlled many of these industries uh, because of the money he was able to wield through finances. But the consequences, we'll talk about some negatives. Living conditions were pretty poor in the cities. That's partly because the cities weren't equipped to um, handle all these new employees. Okay, over time, the living conditions would get better. But at first, they have to just kind of build up some uh, temporary housing. Uh, oftentimes, large families, sometimes even more than one family would be uh, in one room dwellings living together. Um, the crowded, crowded slums began to develop. Uh, when, when people live closer together, uh, it, the conditions aren't very clean. You know, people didn't take nearly as many showers back then, didn't wash their hands as often. This leads to the rise in disease and the spread of disease because the closer you live together, the quicker those things can spread. So the living conditions are not ideal. But like I said, this is partly because industrialization called for workers so fast that it took a while for um, the system to catch up to all that was going on uh, and to build enough housing and better quality housing uh, in order to make life better. Because So this eventually does go away, but initially it is a pretty major problem. This next one too, this one takes a while to go away as well. The work conditions, um, unfortunately, a lot of these owners of these different mills or factories or coal mines, whatever it may be, uh, didn't take into account a lot of the terrible work conditions people were working in. People would work very long hours, uh, even children, because we just got child labor on here was pretty common. But um, a typical work day, this was according to a business owner in Great Britain, for a child was 6 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. That's 14 and a half 
hours. However, there were certain times of year he expected children to work from 3 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's insane. Adults shouldn't be working that long, much less children. So people were working insane amount of hours. They worked typically six days a week, not five days a week. Um, they weren't getting obviously high wages. Uh, also very little safety. Uh, coal mines, poorly ventilated. Uh, the machinery people were working on, they didn't have a lot of safety features. Uh, it wasn't, I'm not going to say it happened every day, but it wasn't uncommon, unfortunately, for people to actually die on the job because some machine breaks down and explodes uh, or in a coal mine because the coal mine collapses on you because they weren't taking safety seriously. So obviously it was a health risk uh, and more people had jobs. And as, as poorly as they did get paid, they, they were getting paid less even to farm. So I'm not saying they weren't getting paid at all. As we, as we get a little bit later, someone like Henry Ford, he actually paid his workers well. John D. Rockefeller tended to pay his workers well and, and didn't see a lot of strikes or labor problems. Uh, where someone like Carnegie, sometimes the work conditions were pretty bad, pay not so good. He did see some strikes at his plants, just to name a few from America. Um, but the working conditions initially not that great, living conditions not that great. Um, so many positive contributions come from the good consequences, higher standard of living for everyone. I mean, some people like to argue on the negative side, say, well, the rich became richer. The thing is the poor became richer in this system as well. It took time for that to happen. But honestly, today, everybody's wages are up. Now there is a elite wealthy class that was created that typically didn't exist before this. This is where people like to talk about how bad capitalism, the thing is capitalism has made everybody wealthier, but it has made some people insanely wealthy as a result. Um, population explosion as a result. Uh, Europe's population increased from 190 million in 1800 to 460 million in 1900. So in those hundred years, uh, about two and a half times the population. Um, especially the population was noticeable in cities. In 1840, England had only two cities with more than 100,000 people. This number is actually pretty insane because by 1910, that would be 70 years later, they had 48 cities with 100,000 or more residents, 48 cities compared to two. So 46 more cities with a population of 100,000 or more. Same thing happens across the world during this time period. You also saw increase in flu supply uh, and industrial production and company this increased population. So in 1800, you know, like I said, the population of Europe was 190 million people and there was hardly enough food supply. By 1900, there's 460 million. Think, oh man, there's a huge food shortage. No, due to industrial processes and advancements in agriculture, which we already talked about and continued advancements in agriculture, you could feed a lot more people. Um, so there tends to be plenty of food. P people tend to be able to have a much higher standard of living in industrialized societies than they had before. Um, so there were negatives, there were positives, people's lives actually overall were better as a result, but there were definitely some problems like we talked about, um, and some factory owners, some business owners, some corporations were slow to, um, treat their workers fairly, to treat their workers well, to pay their workers well. Um, this is where we're not going to talk about this in this class, but you had the rise of labor unions as a result, uh, which resulted in some good things. Uh, labor unions today may have outlived what some of their original intentions were, but they still aren't too bad. Uh, I do have two more questions to ask you that are kind of random that weren't on your um, questions. Um, I do wish that I had asked one of them a little bit earlier, but here we are. So one of random question to ask you. Who is your favorite athlete, sorry, athlete, actor or actress or musician, you know, singer, person in a band, whatever. Just choose one. You know, if you really love sports, choose an athlete. If you're like, I love movies or TV shows, choose an actor, actress. If you're more into music, choose a person at that. But so you don't choose an athlete and an actor, an actress and a musician. Just choose one of those and tell me uh, as, as a side question, just for fun. Also answer a question. Uh, today is. The, the day you're watching this or should be watching this, maybe you watched it a later day, uh, but I did this day in history and birthdays for uh, February 4th. Tell me a famous birthday for someone tomorrow on the 5th. Uh, 
choose anybody and then in one sentence describe who that person is um it could be someone that's really important to you or just the first person you found whatever it may be but someone for february 5th famous birthday all right thanks guys for tuning in um you know, we'll be back in school on Monday. I'm very sure weather is going to start warming up. Uh, looks like late on Friday we're, uh, and Saturday and Sunday, we're going to maybe see some melting. So we should be back by Monday. If not, I guess we we'll, might have to do this again. But uh, make sure you, you fill out your assignment. You don't have to email it to me. Just bring it to class on Monday. Thanks. And uh, hope you uh, have a remaining good couple days off before we get back in class. Bye.